Okay. Mine are all yeah. Russian bots and trolls, so there. All right. Time's running. Here we go. So welcome to Monday Morning Human Intelligence. So you got 30 minutes to shake up your brain and get ready for the week ahead. So what we've got today is Ken Cotto. We're going to get an introduction from him. We have some new folks that are joining us. Hey, Prescott, thanks for joining us here as well. So we do have My the pleasure. chat that's going. So we're open for questions as we go through the discussion. For those of you that are members of our Slack community, we have a Slack thread that's set up. You can also, if you're not a member of the Slack community, please uh, talk to us and we'll get you added on to that as well. So we're thrilled to, uh, to get started. We're gonna talk about lean and agile and applying that to the real world. So I'll go to Rebecca to do a quick uh, intro for Ken. Yeah, and thank you, Ken, for being here. I'm really excited to have Ken join us today. He's a really good friend of mine, and he's a Presidential Innovation Fellow representing the White House, and he's working in the Office of Navy CIO CTO. And as Dan mentioned, we're going to be talking about Agile, but the human aspect behind it, like psych psychological safety and things of that nature. So thanks for being here, Ken. Really excited. Thanks so much. So I guess uh, let's get started. Um, well, I, actually, can, can we do some one thing real quick, just in the interest of uh, user experience? Let's launch a poll, and we're going to find out where people are frustrated at work. So here's a quick poll. You should all be able to uh, answer it this time, even though you're all panelists. And we're just looking to see which of the following things mostly uh, is the biggest source of your frustration at work. Got the uh, answers coming in, so we'll end the poll. So here's the results. So it looks like unclear priorities is in the lead, but a pretty good spread. Unfortunately, nobody is saying that everything is great. So let's spend some time. We'll talk about uh, priority setting. We'll also talk about wasted effort and tools and lack of flexibility. So great. So Ken, we'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear about your experience in lean and agile and applying it to not only uh, running a business, but building software and just uh, living an agile life. Thanks. So uh, I guess a little the context of where I am, where I came from might be a little bit of help. So uh, I come from being startups in Boston. Um, and post my startup life, I got into the defense business at MIT Lincoln Labs. The last notable startup I did in the Air Force was Castle Run, and I left that to become a President's Innovation Fellow, currently detailed to the U.S. Navy. And I'm about to launch another software startup in the Navy now. Um, so I'll do, the biggest challenges I faced running a business to my defense life and one of the, the one that top, you know, ranks top is unclear priorities for sure. Uh, it's interesting. So when I was uh, in my very first startup, prioritization I had no problem with, with my day-to-day -day workload. It turns out I am absolute dog shit at being a CEO. But I didn't know this at first, right? I had to crash and burn to figure out I am a terrible CEO. I'm a great tech guy. I know how to find a company. I know how to, you know, talk about it in bars, restaurants, etc. But day-to-day -day business ops, not this guy. Talking to the VCs, I'm okay at it. So I learned to fail quickly and not necessarily responsibly because my first startup didn't go that well. But then after that, I learned the, the beauty of iteration, right? And this is where we get to Agile and Lean. And a lot of folks conflate the two. Um, Agile really is great for development, right? It's innovative change. Lean is process management. So I lean more to uh, being an Agilist than I do a Lean manager. So I know what my weaknesses are. And some of those things are not prioritization, but prioritizing an entire human circle of people. And that's where I get my lean manager to come in. Like building up a good team to understand your deficit and priorities changes that needle really, really quickly and to be the focus on priorities where people care about certain parts they're passionate about. So that's been the biggest change for me, current life and past startup life about being able to change the way we all think about priority and make it a shared responsibility. So you've got a, uh, a so, ton included in that, in that intro. So thank you for, thank you for those. I, I'm interested in sort of that self uh, introspection, right? So you're all about iterating, you're all about learning and moving on to the next thing. So once you learned that you were not a good CEO, how did you take those lessons, sort of do a personal or maybe even a group retrospective and apply those to your next venture? 
So once I learned that I was not a good CEO, and I mean, let's say for what I'm a terrible CEO. <laughs> I uh, right, you suck. learned to hire. Yeah, I learned to hire CEOs. Like, recognize what you are not good at. Like, everyone thinks they're good at something, right? That's easy to identify, but accepting what you're terrible at, really different thing, right? So, for me, like, my mode of learning in response to failure was just really recognizing and accepting I suck as a CEO, right? No matter how much money changes. But what changed for me was hiring a CEO. So working with VCs, you have an opportunity to hire some really incredible seasoned CEOs. And here's what I learned, right? First of all, I, you know, I, I have many long lasting friendships with my past CEOs from past companies that I run. And it became a really cool mentorship for me of learning how to be a better CEO, how to be a better founder, and also learn this really amazing thing where, you know, and when you first start a company, you think getting a CEO means leading away the company. What it actually does is it frees me to run my company. So a CEO does the tackling and blocking for you with the VCs and any other kind of business interest. The day-to-day -day minutia of frankly shit that I couldn't be bothered with as a technologist. Mm -hmm. Good, so it, it I, seems like an order. Yeah, it's, it's Rebecca, I'm gonna come right to you because ha hiring a CEO and working with someone like that requires a lot of trust. So I'd like to uh, go to Rebecca real quick for your thoughts. Yeah, so you've mentioned quite a few times that you're a terrible CEO and <laughs> clearly you have to fail to recognize that. I'm just curious, I mean, you didn't go into it and accepting the first time you failed, I'm a terrible CEO. How did you build up to that? Was it working with a group and building trust with the group where you felt comfortable to discuss your failures with them? Or how did that work? So uh, there's a couple of VCs I work with in Boston, which we had really great personal relationships and not just a business relationships. So having a great personal relationship with your business partners enables a really great opportunity for psychological safety, which is critical in any working relationship. Without psychological safety, you don't have the opportunity or do you feel enabled to discuss your shortcomings, your problems, your blockers. So having that available early on was really, really great so that I was able to get past this you know how I'm a terrible CEO, show me how to do things better really, really quickly versus dragging it along the VCs because they're so believed in the fact that I'm a good technologist, they recognize what I suck at and we didn't have to beat around the bush. So it, it was actually really nice. So Ken, I'm, I'm interested, you know, folks, uh, you know, most are frustrated by the lack of clear priorities in their own business or their own work, their own organizations. So sort of can you give us an idea of your approach to how to set priorities and how to stick to those priorities and not be diverted by the, the crisis of the day? Sure. Um, we get used to, as we to do a startup, it is the crisis of the day. You have to put out this fire today, that fire today, and you don't have time to plan for the next fire. Well, the trick is to really just to draw the line in the sand so that you actually start to change behavior around you so you can actually stop putting out fires and start planning a day. So that comes with the different things, right? So personal life. Uh, if it wasn't for my calendar, I would be terrible at remembering, remembering all the meetings, right? So mm -hmm. use it to your be you know, best benefit, you know. Uh, I met some really great designers who have really cool creative uses with their, uh, mm -hmm. not just their calendar, but they also tie in with their own personal Trello boat. So they use Trello in their personal life. Like I met designers, hilariously enough, like an entire like apartment flat of them living together and their chores are done in Trello. Hilariously enough, right? So, you know, there are plenty of enabling tools available to us. Why not leverage them? You know, we have this, we have this narrow mindset almost of like, this is for work, this is not for work. Why? So be flexible, I guess, for me, is how I start to change how I think about prioritization and how they get away from putting out those fires. The moment I can make a plan and stick to a plan, I am less likely to have to suddenly pull out a raging fire because it will never be a raging fire again. Yeah, so, so I know a lot of the folks I, on the call have a, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Rebecca, please go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, because you said Trello, I have to bring this up. 
because that that brings us to tools versus people, right? So do you think or tell me your experience in humans and then tools, right? So can you still be agile and get things done without having this amazing tool stack? I don't just tell me about that because me and Trello have a very bad relationship. Even me and Slack have a bad relationship. <laughs> right. <laughs> like we, I have uh, a bad relationship with technology. <laughs> right. I mean, he, uh, here is the secret to being agile and lean. Uh, visibility of work and communication. How you get those two things done, frankly, doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> we use Slack as a mean for fast communication, but isn't necessary. We use Trello as a means to put something on the visible board, but you could do, you could accomplish the same thing with a whiteboard. Like it doesn't matter how you get it done, but what will make a difference is how your team gravitates towards how they use that process. Do they use these tools to further the process of their work or are they so sunk in the idea of I have to have this tool to get this job done or else, right? So the, for me, the correct thing is the tools don't matter. Listen to the people, we get the feedback of what your team wants to do and what they want to leverage. And end of the day, you know, there's a difference. So I, I, I kind of, I guess I defer back to this really amazing uh, quote I came across where there's a difference between living and breathing and actually being an agile practitioner and doing agile. Doing agile gets you a 20% increase in your basic productivity being a practitioner gets you a 200 percent increase because you suddenly shunt away all the shit that doesn't matter when it comes to frankly quote unquote agile much like much like tools for the people yeah so I, I love what you're saying and I, and I think my experience is that tools are easy i can learn tools i can watch some youtube videos about tools there's a community around those tools and they teach me how to use those things and people are difficult, right? People are messy and people have things that are going on outside of work. And it's uh, much easier for me to demonstrate competency in dealing with a tool than in dealing with a person. So I'm curious about you and the, the types of folks that you work around. How do you help them to see things your way, right? And, and lean towards the people and let the tool help those people to do their job rather than being the focus. Sure. So the thing I teach every junior engineer that they don't learn in college is really, really simple. Empathy. If you approach any situation from a perspective of empathy, not what do I want to get out of this situation is what does this person feel about the situation? The answer is very different. So that mm -hmm. answer stops being tactical and it now becomes engagement. And that has been far more powerful to me. Now, here's the unfortunate truth and business though, is that there is absolutely no way in hell that you're not gonna piss somebody off. That you're not gonna make someone stupid buffer over something that there's no way you can fix this, right? It is easier to change someone's mind than it is to change how they feel. So, mm -hmm. you know, I recently had a, a occurrence in the Navy where, you know, because I'm being a software startup and because I have to support the CNO, the CNO, and the vice admiral for military acquisitions, basically the top three brass of the Navy, I have a lot of white swath of pathways. Some people, career, government folks, kind of hate me for it, right? They think I have the easy button. Hey, I don't disagree with you. And I'm sorry you feel that way. But truth be told, what they can get over how they feel is that no matter how they feel about it, I'm still making a difference and I'm not gonna change what I'm going to do. I'm sorry you feel that way, but I'm still making a positive impact to many people's lives. I wish you could come along for the ride. The best I can give you is an apology. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. I mean, that's not, a, uh, that's not an, easy, an easy thing to do in any, um, any environment, particularly in the Department of Defense. We have some deeply entrenched culture and um, behaviors that are not necessarily helpful. And I know we have other folks that are on the line that are also uh, Scrum Masters. I'm a recently certified uh, Scrum Master, thanks to Sagayo Studios and uh, TJ, as well as uh, Heidi, who's joining us on our call. We were in the same group there. So if we talk to you about priorities, we would expect that you would say that value drives priorities, right? You prioritize the things that are going to bring the most value to the work that you're trying to do. But the human 
that is, it's a human that determines that value. So how do you sort of balance the various positions, the various stakeholders, the various equities to get to some, um, the core of what the value is so that you know what you should be working on? So what drives value at the end of the day is what human beings want. So to, in order to understand that value, there's different methodologies, right? We have a uh, value stream mapping from uh, Six Sigma, for example, that understands how to understand the given intrinsic value of a process and the shortcomings of that process to increase efficiency. We can actually apply the same practice of value stream mapping from Six Sigma to human beings. And it turns out, especially in the, the DoD community, we are entrenched with just really long-standing processes that people have learned to accept that's there. So my favorite thing is to be able to engage people directly and just ask a simple question. Tell me what sucks about this. And mm -hmm. through user interviews, through human interviews, uh, we have a better understanding of making a product that people actually want to use without guessing. So instead of trying to guess what people want to use and expect people to use the way you think it needs it, simply ask. So I, I think that's, um... That's a great approach to a lot of things, right? So when you work with humans and you talk to humans, you learn about humans and what they need. And that's what uh, Monday Morning Human Intelligence is all about. I know that you and your work with Kessel Run, you went to the Combined Air Operations Center in Qatar and you developed some uh, software products that helped to save uh, millions and millions of dollars and continue to save that money uh, while we're here today. But my experience in the military has been that value is determined by the rank of the person saying it's valuable, right? The, if a high ranking person says, this is what I value, then suddenly everyone values that thing as well. And it's, I mean, it's the way that we're built and it's not necessarily a bad way, but how do you help advise these very senior leaders to listen to the folks that are closer to the problem and maybe adjust their view of what's uh, valuable? So one of the things we did in Castle Run, specific to the DOD and the idea of rank, is that we made a cultural statement early on that says rank doesn't matter. Now it does to a degree, right? Like no one's gonna speak over the 06. <laughs> Beyond that, uh, day to day uh, in a software team, I could have a major and a sergeant uh, paired together, same team, they are equals. The other thing we stopped doing in KR is wearing uniforms for many reasons, but one of them being that we didn't want that to override the idea of some kind of a credential seniority importance. If everyone dressed in their cities, you know, the only way you could pick out the military personnel is by haircut. Mm -hmm. no, so great. that gave us that. a flat aura. Thanks. I, so, I wanted yeah. to emphasize too, if you don't mind, sorry, on the, <laughs> can you, you shared your your document on culture um, recently with me and you actually specifically mentioned how rank doesn't define priority yep. so if you could just give like a quick little snippet on that because i think that's super important that's something you guys talk about used to talk about at kessel run and they still do all the time is how even somebody who's like what is it a, a gs i don't know the the terms gs4 versus gs15 how anybody can have a good idea Right, so you know, and this also touches back upon the idea of psychological safety, right? In order for people to express their opinion equally, I need to be able to enable people to speak freely without worrying about their career based on pissing off a superior officer or a higher rank GS. So the way to do that is to be able to prioritize everyone's idea so long as it's good as the current priority, be it it comes from the GS4 or 5 or the GS50. It shouldn't matter. If the moment you start leading priorities to rank, you run the risk of disagreements of whether or not there's value. Rank doesn't necessarily tell you if the value aligns, except for the wants of military leadership which is a bigger picture of war fighting, but down to the tactical level of making software for you are two different prioritization stacks. So we've got now just under uh, 10 minutes. I'd like to open it up to questions. So if anybody would like to uh, ask a question, you can come off mute and raise your hand and we'll see you and we'll let you uh, ask a question. Also, 
Um, the chat is still working. We also have folks that uh, can put into the chat your LinkedIn connection if you want to connect with other folks that are on this call. Do you have folks that are um, sort of similar, similar thinking along wanting to improve things and develop more processes that are more agile and lean? Are there any questions from the group? So um, thank you for that, Ken. And I just wanted to go back to your comments about empathy and the tools that people use. And one of the things that I put in the comments is, is that transitioning from one tool to another because you know that fundamentally and technically that new tool is better can be very challenging in an environment where your users are committed and invested in the tool that they already use. And um, even though the tool may be in, inferior that they use to what you want to implement for the sake of psychological safety, for the sake of um, supporting the individuals in their work, sometimes it's just better to allow them to use the, use the tools that they've grown accustomed to using and work with them through that tool. Um, with a potential future idea of transitioning later or possibly finding ways of doing so incrementally. Has your experience spoken to that at all? So here's what we see, um, especially in a data that echo? Is that better? That's good. Okay. Um, you know, like, because we don't ever, you know, snap that chalk line on the tool, we now have people who use uh, Excel to put in stuff, to print, to walk up to another station for this person to read and then put it into the application, right? So the way I discovered that I was able to get people to transition to different tools is I pick a couple of people from different business segments, right? Or different units and train one enabler per segment of human beings and just enable that person well. Like that, I could have a musically productive meeting, right? I could have five or six people together, train them really well on the new tool, and then let them go forth to train. So give them the, you know, the power to execute and to tell their people, you know, give me feedback. Let's you know, tell me when you can meet to do a great training with us, you know, with the new enablers, and then have this enablers group, you know, report back to me on when those dates are, and then kind of Look at the dates and go, okay, how about this day's a sunset day? Does that work for everybody? Great. And that's how it's been, you know, does it, do you have some people kicking and screaming at the end? Yes, you do. But those folks do come around as they approach it to hit that oh crap moment and then be able to start, you know, kind of leaning on the enablers to go, show me how to do this. I'm, I'm not going to have this tool anymore. So th that's how I've been uh, able to get that going. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. I have cool. another question. Yeah, please go ahead. I, um, so if there's something that we could all take away from this call, um, just like one little piece of advice, if we are in an organization that is struggling with like, the tools and the human interaction, right? Because I know personally I've, I've dealt with that quite a bit. What, what piece of advice could you give us, at least from your experience, that we could take away from this? Uh, in terms of watching people on struggle bus using tools in weird ways, or <laughs> if you like they're using the wrong tools, like what's the what's the specific? So that the specific is when it comes to being productive, do we have to use the tool in a specific way to be successful? Gotcha. So no. This is way this is way personal to me. Clearly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> very very mental. Everybody uh, on the call can see it. <laughs> So uh, no, there isn't any prescribed way to use any given tool, and you see actually scope creep of these tools regularly. Uh, there's a business that actually made a small investment. They became one of the biggest businesses based on this exact problem called Salesforce, right? Mm -hmm. Salesforce was there to track business leads. Now it's used for everything, in including the kitchen sink, right? So no, there's no one way to use it. Sometimes the way people use different tools either shock me or on me, right? <laughs> Sometimes it's horrifying going, part of the back of my brain would be, 
why are you doing it that way? But you know, I need to resist that instinct of saying it out loud because this is what these folks know. So instead of shaming somebody into it, I tried to kind of nudge them in the right direction and go, hey, I see you tried to do like a, you know, a very messy mobbing of ideas on Slack, which honestly Slack is a good for because you got a lot of noise in it. How about if we use this tool instead, let's try this way one time, come with me on this. So coming from, you know, that place of like, I'd rather show you how and enable you to do it better, at least in my opinion, versus shaming you has been a little bit more successful. Yeah, thank you for that. So there's some good, um, some good words in the chat about tools like a screwdriver and about how no one, human creativity opens up many ways to use a, a screwdriver in different ways, just like you would use different tools in different ways. So we're only about th just over three minutes left. And this may not be fair to ask you uh, this question with not very much time, but in the paper that you wrote that you, you let us take a look at, you said that you would prioritize raw talent over domain knowledge. My question is, like, how do you judge that raw talent? And I think one of the pitfalls that we fall into is that we tend to think the people that are most like us are the most talented people. <laughs> so how do you ensure that you get a breadth of folks that are on your team and, and don't have this uh, sort of group think about we need more people like us? So, you know, you, you definitely have to uh, get the right skill sets in terms of getting that raw talent, but the actual raw talent I was look for are two things, drive and problem solving. Because if a human being has those two things, I could just sit them on the problem and they're gonna just go until they can't go any further. And yes, I see the, uh, <laughs> the yes, the, the Google you, like Lord knows I've done that earlier in my career. I get stuck in a really weird Java problem like a decade ago, go, why is this happening? But it's really important to find the human raw talent, the features of that makes them drive towards a problem and not away from it. That for me is the raw talent that I look for because when it comes to coding better, uh, doing infrastructure code or security better, I can teach you that. I can't teach you to push so hard on a problem that you lose sleep over. Right. So I think it's, um, it's, it's appropriate. You know, today is uh, National Moon Day, right? So celebrating the, uh, the landing of man on the, on the moon. And that's all was a series of problem solving. And it, when, we, when you look into that and you look at the way that people were driven to do that, um, it really came down to connecting a person's daily work with that higher purpose. That when they were connected to a higher purpose, they were able to tap into their intrinsic motivation and able to keep solving problems and keep over and over and over solving the, the series of problems that were needed in order for us to uh, humans to make it to the, uh, to the moon. So I think connecting people to the thing that drives them and in your work in the Department of Defense, you sort of have a, a leg up on that, I think, where you're able to um, connect them to the higher purpose of the defense of the nation or to saving lives. So that seems like it'd be a great benefit for you. So thank you for joining us. We just have about uh, one minute left. So um, if you're open to having folks uh, connecting with you, we can um, yeah. point them towards your LinkedIn and it'd be a great time to, uh, to connect, get to know other people that are thinking along these lines and be able to follow the great work that you're doing. Uh, Rebecca, do you have any, uh, any closing words before we shift to the end? Yeah, apparently Ken can access the G Suite from Nipper or whatever it's called. So whoever yep. said you can't, looks like you can connect with him, find uh, out. There, there was a lot of uh, high, uh, DOD CIO <laughs> level uh, exceptions to get that done, but it's possible. It's possible. All right. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for being possible. here. Thanks, everybody. Hey, thanks. We'll look forward <laughs> to, uh, so to seeing you next week. We'll have another great guest. Thanks, Ken, for being yeah. with us. Uh, I hope you have before a we, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, before we cut out, uh, there was a request for information. What is the quickest way to share it? Is it here? Is it elsewhere? How should I do this? So, too, send it to me. We'll post it on the, uh, on the Slack. And then whoever's uh, asking for the information in particular, you can send a note to me. We'll get you onto our Slack as well. And we'll make sure that's, uh, that's shared. So, thank you. Awesome. Time's up. I appreciate you uh, being with us. And we look forward to next week. All right. See you. Thanks. Thanks, man. Bye.